Hello, and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, Episode 115, Operation Merita, Part 3. As bad as things were going for the Aussies and New Zealanders, it was worse for the Greek 12th and 20th Divisions to the west. They had been retreating more slowly than those Allied forces making for Thermopylae, and by now, it seemed, the fate of each force would be determined separately. And at the moment, the Greeks' immediate commander, General Slo La Goklo, fretted over their lack of ammunition and water. The first allowed them to fend off the enemy, the latter kept them alive. But the bullets and shells became even more precious as the SS Adolf Hitler division came their way. The German division had been ordered to continue south and now make for Yenina in western Greece, parallel with Mount Olympus. If it could be reached, then the Greeks, no matter their bravery, would be cut off from help, and then they would either have to surrender or fight their way through, alone. On April 19th, as General Wilson was trying to form up his troops at Thermopylae, Wavell decided to fly to Athens and call his BEF commander to him to discuss the idea of evacuation. Wavell put the matter bluntly to his subordinate. With the Germans under Rommel surging in North Africa, having already retaken El Aguila, Benghazi, and Derna, we'll get to that last one soon, there was no hope of reinforcements making their way to Greece, and that pretty much decided the overall situation. The 7th Australian Division and the Polish Brigade, earmarked for Greece, would now be sent to the Western Desert. Because the other side of the coin was, if the Allies did try to stay in Greece and drag this out, however long the duration, they would be responsible for feeding and defending the Greek populace. Both were currently beyond the ability of the British Empire. Okay, so it was time to leave, but their best port, Piraeus, was a no-go, due to the lucky German bomb dropped on that ship of ammunition that devastated the port's facilities. Another port capable of handling their needs, Volos, was just to the southeast of Larissa, and now in German hands. Another no-go. If needs must, they would leave from the beaches to the far south. After all, they had done it before. The idea of starting over at Thermopylae was abandoned. It was time to pull out. In some ways, the British didn't know how lucky they were. Ever since the weather cleared up on April 15th and the Germans dominated the skies, Stukas had been pounding everything and anything they flew over. Tanks, armored vehicles, trucks, long lines of infantry, or Greek civilians, even farm animals. Yet there was no method to their madness from on high. They seemed to be everywhere. But a clear head would have said it was best to bomb the lead vehicles and thereby stall all those behind them. But the Germans were enjoying their shooting or in this case bombing gallery, and assumed each bomb that hit was bringing the Allies closer to giving up before being able to escape. Yet it was that last one, the dead farm animals, that drew the ire of the locals most. After all, that was their livelihood or means of feeding their families. More than one German pilot, but fortunately for them, not too many, that managed to get themselves shot down, found a cruel end waiting for them if they were found by the populace before the British soldiers. Any situation can always be worse, so it's time to interject some politics into this military fiasco. Just days before Wavell and Wilson met, rumors swirled around Athens that numerous British troops had been massacred, and the Germans were just days away from the capital. To combat any pro-German street marches from developing, heavily armed police were sent out to keep a wary eye. Yet some Athenians took it upon themselves to search out and destroy any public anti-Nazi posters. Yet again, there appeared out of nowhere pictures of Hitler atop the desk of the chief of police. Truly a house divided. 
But that bifurcated house also existed among the political elites of Greece as well. Papademos, the Greek war minister, made public his thoughts that resistance was futile. Giving actions to his words, he informed all his generals that they, on their own, should determine the course of action they and their men took. Other cabinet ministers supported this, or at least an honorable surrender. But then the British made all this known to the Greek king, George II. Shouldn't he have known this? Anyway, once the monarch found out, he put a stop to it. As for what to do next, there was talk in Athens of forming a new government, and then deciding. Not exactly the best way to run anything. As the dejected and exhausted Allied soldiers started arriving at Thermopylae on April 18th, the smarter of the lot found the local warm sulfur springs and plunged in, relaxing their overwrought bodies, minds, and souls. And there was a little time for this. The Italians to the northwest were certainly taking their time coming south. Mussolini knew the show was no longer his. Pushing his men would, besides getting them killed by frustrated Greeks, not change the pace of this war. It would be over soon enough, and he would then remind his German colleague that Greece was in his purview. As for C&C Wavell, he was certainly taking an optimistic view by considering the following. If the Italians were going to hold themselves back, and if the Germans could be held back, perhaps the coalescing line at Thermopylae could give the Allies time to withdraw all their troops and prepare a much stronger defense on Crete. And because it pays to plan, Egypt. Wavell was not forgetting Rommel. A glass is half full view indeed. But what was his alternative? On April 18th, as the Allies were arriving at Thermopylae, General Papagos took his dejected demeanor to the king. His argument was that the British leadership had blown it from the outset. The Germans were allowed to surge south at the very beginning and divide the Greek forces in the west from those of the Alakmon line. Making it worse, the Greeks were then withdrawn too late. And finally, reports had come in that the Germans were readying themselves to drive on Yiyani. If that was allowed to happen, the men of the Greek 12th and 20th would truly be trapped. They would either have to surrender or be massacred, considering their lack of water and ammunition. No, my lord, it was time for the Allies to leave. And then, believe it or not, things became even murkier. The king initially supported the continued resistance, as we have seen by not allowing the Greek generals to decide their own course of action. But soon after, and the British ambassador Michael Pallare would later swear to this, then the Greek government gave its approval for the Allies to leave. Wavell tried to confirm this decision by saying, even though he had already decided to leave, that the Allies would stay, my lord, if Greece wanted them to. He was not asked to stay. Divine from that what you will. As for the Greek premier, a banker of all things, Karitsits collapsed under the weight of it all, and who can blame him? Returning from a meeting with the Greek cabinet, where the cabinet was saying surrender, and the king was saying, probably half-heartedly, keep going, the very much human Karitsits locked himself into his bedroom and committed suicide a pistol shot to the head. A story was put out of Karitsit's heart failure due to pushing himself so hard for his country, but no one bought the story. Getting back to those Greek soldiers in the West, they actually tried, despite their deprivations, to retreat and stop the motorized SS Adolf Hitler division simultaneously from reaching Yanina, yet they could not. So, their local general decided his men would not die for nothing, and surrendered on April 20th. Athens found out about this when they radioed the force the next day. The reply came back in German. Something to the effect of, it's now in German hands. To cover their collective backsides within the government and throughout the country, the Greek high command made it clear, 
the two Greek divisions had not been, repeat, not been defeated by the Italians. Instead, they surrendered to the Germans because a German force was about to attack them in their rear. Their situation had been hopeless. Playing his part, Field Marshal von List, the commander of the German 12th Army, agreed to accept the surrender without the Italians in tow. But Mussolini would have his way and his day. Il Duce complained to Hitler, who told von List an Italian had to be present. Honor, but certainly not the Greeks, was at stake. Therefore, later, when General Yodel accepted the surrender of Greece, Italian General Ferrero was right there beside him. With the surrender of the Greeks in the West, a domino effect came about. The Greek king and government evacuated to Crete, but not before leaving a note with the British ambassador that said, Thank you for all that you have done. I'm sure that was meant to be read in a positive tone. Whereas Wavell, upon hearing of the Greek forces' surrender, decided it was best to push up his departure date, as nothing was now holding up that SS Adolf Hitler division to their northwest. And finally, having accepted the Greek surrender, the Germans, guessing the Allies would make for Crete, concentrated their bombing on the many rail lines to the south of the Allies, as well as possible evacuation points. This would not be Dunkirk all over again. On April 22nd, a general announcement was made to the Allies that they would be leaving, but that announcement came with detailed orders. Only firearms that could be carried could be retained. Everything else was to be destroyed. This included vehicles once the passengers had reached their destination. This included horses, which were shot. The mules were handed over to the locals. This included Greek rail cars and engines, which were rammed into each other at high speeds. The Greeks understood why all this was being done, but they also understood how all this destruction would affect them during the next winter, and, to their credit, only stopped the British forces one time, at gunpoint, when sappers attempted to destroy 30,000 tons of petrol. The locals knew this would incense the German airmen, and perhaps the Greeks could be allowed to use a little for themselves. The ancient philosophers said that true happiness comes from within. Well, obviously, they never played Best Fiends. This free-to-download game has it all. Fun characters, new challenges, and thousands of puzzles to play. Whenever I have a few minutes, I bring it up, and I carry on with my quest to get to level 1000 before my wife does. The competition in our house is fierce, more fiendish, and bragging rights are everything. I'm currently on level 87, so I have a ways to go, but that's part of the fun. The gathering of cute characters is my fave by far. I love the artwork. And you can play Best Fiends without an internet connection once you download it. And know that every win brings new challenges and new in-game events are added all the time. So let enough is never enough be your mantra. Download Best Fiends for free from the App Store or Google Play. Plus, earn even more with $5 worth of in-game rewards when you reach level 5. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. The overall plan was to evacuate to Crete and thence to Egypt. But now that the Luftwaffe dominated the skies, every step south was fraught with danger. And on April 20th, the same day the Greek forces in the Epirus Mountains surrendered, the RAF made their last major attempt to contest the air over southern Greece. On came the 15 hurricanes, which was all that was left of three squadrons, and gave combat to the opposing force of at least 120 aircraft. Some say it was close to 200. The British pilots, well, the ones that survived, claimed they didn't engage in dogfights so much as tried to avoid ramming into German planes. Yet by the time it was over, the RAF had taken out 22 enemy aircraft, while losing five of their own, but only four of those pilots. The fifth was later rescued. This left the Luftwaffe to, casually, it seemed to some of the men on the ground, destroy the last 13 RAF planes in the area, 
the very last seven planes that D'Albiac, the British air commander, had were sent to Crete. As there was to be no air cover, it was decided to evacuate the men along the ports of the Peloponnese at the southern tip of the country, instead of the beaches, a la Dunkirk, of Attica, that part of Greece around Athens, because there the men would have been more exposed due to that part of the country's relative openness. Of course, the Germans weren't doing nothing during all this. On April 24th, a play was made for Thermopylae. If the line there could be broken, then Hitler would have his success, and the German high command their revenge against the British. A few days before the attack, German engineers had been repairing the bridges over the Spiriakos River to the northwest of Thermopylae. Meanwhile, German dive bombers had been harassing and keeping distant any Allied force close enough to disrupt this work. And finally, the bridges were passable. But as the German armor poured over the bridges and headed for the city, British and New Zealand gunners had been able to not only halt their advance, but take out 15 tanks with their 25-pounders. The reason for this was simple. The artillery units did not have to consider husbanding their shells. They were going to destroy whatever they couldn't carry, so blasted away at anything that moved. This blooding of the German nose gave the aggressors pause, so they sent in more planes. But again, the Allied anti-air units, equally unconcerned about running out of shells, fired up into the air as fast as they could reload. During all this, the Allies were evacuating Thermopylae and now heading for Athens. And by April 25th, the majority of the BEF was in or near Athens. The only units still north of their new but temporary home was the 4th New Zealand Brigade and those of the 1st Armour Brigade that still had tanks. Whereas the Germans, after an uncomfortable number of casualties, human and machine, finally entered Thermopylae only to find it abandoned. Yet the main road from there to Athens was so pockmarked with holes due to demolitions that panzers had to be sent along mountainous tracks just to keep the advance going. And that going was now at a snail's pace. The other reason for the slowness of the advance was misinformation from German intelligence. Von List had been told of a respectable number of Allied troops with anti-armor and anti-air weaponry stationed around Thebes in between Thermopylae and Athens. The Allies wished they had as many men as the report said. So, hence the cautious advance. Having decided on ports of the Peloponnese as their departure locations, the three highest-ranking Allied officers made their way to the peninsula and they arrived by the 25th. Yet Major General Freiburg, the commander of the New Zealand forces, decided he would stay and oversee the evacuation. General Blamey was on his way to Egypt. There would be a further phase to this war, and he wanted to be prepared, whereas Wilson was en route to Crete to deal with the developing next phase of the war. During their wars with Yugoslavia and Greece, not to mention all the other battles they had fought on land and won. The Germans were not used to this hold-up after hold-up, delay after delay. Something had to give. At this rate, the Allies would get away to fight another day. Something outside the box was needed. The answer was the third dimension. If the bridge at Corneth to the east of Athens and the canal area surrounding it could be captured by airborne troops, then not only would advancing their troops be expedited, hopefully to the point of catching up to many of the Allied troops, but any of those Allied troops still east of Corneth, near Athens, would be cut off from the evacuation points of the Peloponnese. If it worked, it answered all their questions. So, on April 26th, von List released hell from above. At 6 a.m. that morning, 30 dive bombers rained death and destruction on those anti-air units around Corneth. This went on for 30 minutes, which is a very long time to be bombed. 
but just in case those bombers missed their objectives of killing or wounding the men below. The 110 ME-110s that accompanied them then flew in low and used their machine guns to finish off anyone still moving. Then, just enough Ju-52 transport aircraft to hold 800 men, which included two battalions of the 2nd Parachute Rifle Regiment, a company in artillery, one medical company, and an engineering platoon, flew in low, about 200 feet, and opened their doors. Those men of the 19th New Zealand Battalion that survived the bombs and the gun strafing rose and pointed their guns upward. Those parachutists that floated down first suffered heavy casualties, as there was now little interference for those below. Other German soldiers missed their mark and landed in the canal itself. But within minutes, as more German riflemen safely landed, organized, and engaged the New Zealanders, those parachutists that came after them had an easier time of it. Moving quickly, German engineers dashed for the bridge to start removing the explosives as their comrades engaged the Allies, who were quickly succumbing to the aggressors. And here is where the story leaves the realm of possibility. About 200 yards south of the bridge, two British officers had taken cover, but were still under fire. They watched in horror as a dozen or so Germans started removing the explosives. At that moment, one of the officers either Captain Phillips or Lieutenant Tyson, raised his rifle, hoping to hit and thus detonate some of the remaining explosives. The first shot apparently missed, but as the man squeezed off his second shot, that part of the bridge disappeared in a cloud of smoke as the explosives obliterated everything in its vicinity. The Germans on the bridge fell with the structure 50 feet down into the water. In the confusion, the two officers got away. After the war, both men were given the military cross, but most historians who have studied the event believe that perhaps a stray anti-aircraft shell started the explosion. Still, what a tell to tell at the local pub. For the Germans, the bridge was lost, but the battle won, and in only two hours with the 2nd Parachute Rifle Regiment managing to overcome the 19th New Zealand Battalion and the 4th Hussars just outside Corneth before they could get their tanks into the fight. By the end of the day, the Germans had lost 237 paratroopers, but the survivors managed to capture 900 Allied prisoners, besides the casualties they left on the ground. Strangely, the Germans did not follow up this victory with a dash at the Allied troops heading south on the Peloponnese. Perhaps they realized the vast majority of those troops had already been through Corneth before the air assault. Yet the 4th New Zealand Brigade and parts of other units were not of that number. They were still in Athens. So the 4th received radio orders from Freiburg to gather up stragglers and make their way east for Porto Rafti and Rafina along the eastern edge of Attica and create a perimeter. The idea was to hold off the Germans during that day and run like hell for the beaches after dark. The Royal Navy was doing its utmost to be ready to disembark as many men as they could that night. But it was made clear to everyone that all ships had to leave a few hours before daylight because then they would become the prey of the Luftwaffe. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. So uh, a lot of people to thank, so I'll just jump right into it. Uh, as far as my newest members, I'd like to say hello and thank you to uh, Pagreg B. from London, Chris J. from New Zealand. So thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, as far as some people that bought some CDs, I'm guessing their Christmas presents this year. Um, one from VA Squires in um, Kent, UK, and one from Steve A. in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, let's see, VA bought The Battle of Britain, Volume 1, and Steve bought the, just the, the first of the CDs. So thank you very much. I really do appreciate it. As far as donations, I got a nice donation from Daniel E.F. from Greeley, Colorado. 
Thank you very much, Daniel. And Pete W. from Southampton, UK. And uh, thank you very much. And uh, a big thank you to Isaac M., who bought a History of World War II podcast ball cap from El Dorado, Kansas, who's probably looking smart right now walking around El Dorado. So if you want any more baseball caps, let me know. I've got them. Just send me an email. And, of course, I'd like to thank the people who bought some Churchill mugs. Uh, Andrew, uh, Andrew E. Bozzi, 1718, uh, he bought a Churchill mug. And Wayne G. from Lexington, Kentucky, he also bought a Churchill mug. So I've got Churchill mugs, um, FDR mugs. Check them out on the website. I've also got Caesar mugs for those of you who've uh, taken my advice and listened to the Caesars show. We just did episode 24, so there's a lot for you to listen to in between these episodes. So again, just thank you to everybody um, who's supporting the show. I hope you like it. And we, Kim and I, as, as a team and as individuals with our own podcasts, are really trying to get to the point where we can do this full time. So your support means a lot to us. Thank you very much. And just remember me if you need Christmas presents for those hard to get people. So thank you very much. And I will see you as soon as I can with the next episode.